Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the United States Institute of Peace, I am delighted to welcome you all here. It is a great honor to see all friends here and colleagues and friends of USIP and also welcoming you, those who are of, of you who are viewing us online. I'm Dr. Joseph Sani, Vice President of the US Institute of Peace and leading the Africa Center. I know most of you in this room already know about US, uh, the United States Institute of Peace. But for those viewing online, I will try, allow me to briefly introduce the United States Institute of Peace. USIP was founded by Congress, almost the US Congress, almost 40 years ago, with the mandate to prevent, resolve conflict around the world. And we do that by working with a variety of stakeholders, including government, security forces, civil society, religious leaders, the private sector. The Africa Center is deeply involved in peace building in Africa. We believe that the Africa Center is well pleased to bring this variety of stakeholders to discuss issues of peace and development on the continent. And so, the Africa Center is pleased to be hosting today we, a conversation with Ambassador Martin Kimani, Kenyan's permanent representative to the United Nations. Ambassador Kimani has served as Kenya's permanent representative at the UN for almost two years and previously served as the president's special envoy for countering violence extremism, the director of Kenya's National Counter Terrorism Center, and in strategic initiatives in the president's executive office. Even before arriving in New York, Ambassador Kimani had a deep knowledge of the UN system from his service as permanent representative to the United Nations in Nairobi, as well as the UN Environment Program and the UN Human Settlement Program, UN Habitat. He has worked on peace and security issues in the Horn of Africa and East Africa. Ambassador Kimani, is also a fellow of the African Leadership Initiative and a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. He holds a PhD in war studies from King's College London, the University of London. Kenya is currently one of the three African states which holds a non-permanent seat on the UN Security Council until December this year. In his role as Kenya's permanent representative, he has distinguished himself as a strong voice for Kenya and Africa in the Council. Ambassador Kimani's February 22nd statement, we all remember, uh, during the emergency session of the, uh, the UN Security Council on the situation in Ukraine was quite clear. He strongly, through that statement, condemned Russia's violation of the territorial integrity of Ukraine and underscored the importance of African voices on threat to global security. That speech and subsequent ones delivered by Ambassador Kimani shows the experience and the importance of African voices and approaches in multilateral fora and how important is Africa as a geostrategic actor. With that, please join me in welcoming His Excellency Ambassador Martin Kimani. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Makila James, a senior advisor here at the US Institute of Peace Africa Center, and it is my distinct honor and pleasure to be moderating this conversation with Ambassador Kimani. 
Ambassador Kimani, we thought we would have you do some opening remarks, but more importantly, let's just get right into the conversation because I think you're a great conversationalist. We'd rather just start the conversation right away. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, Ambassador Kimani, is this narrative around Africa right now. Where are we in the narrative of what is Africa, what is Africa's trajectory, trajectory what is its future? The long-held narrative that we all know on Africa is Africa as a poor continent, high unemployment, um, destabilizing internal conflicts, expansion of violent terrorist threats, and coups and counter coups. And that, that narrative has been a long-standing one. It basically speaks to an Africa that doesn't have any influence in multilateral fora, an Africa that is too poor and troubled to really be a global player. Then we turn to what is the reality on the ground. You look at the reality on the ground today. Very different narrative. You see African governments and African people setting their own agenda for politics and security and economics. You look at the African Union's historic African continental free trade agreement, game changer for the continent. You look at what's happening with the political affairs, Peace and Security Commission really struggling with some really difficult challenges on the continent. You look at the African Union condemning and sanctioning coup leaders. And most significantly for many of us, this dynamism of young people who are creative and entrepreneurial and who are driving technology on the continent. So then you have this narrative of unstoppable Africa. So between unstoppable Africa and troubled Africa that really can't be a global player and is almost outside of history in some people's Im image, where do you see Africa falling today? Well, um, thank you. We've gone straight into it. Uh, thank you and <laughs> good morning. Uh, Ambassador Makila James, thank you very much for the invitation and, and for uh, having me in for this conversation. I want to just quickly thank uh, Liz Grant, the CEO and President of USIP, uh, Dr. Joseph Sani, for, uh, the, who leads the, Africa, the Vice President for the Africa Center, um, and of course my elder, Ambassador Johnny Cochran, uh, for his continu I mean uh, Carson, sorry, uh, for his continuing um, um, extraordinary commitment to to Africa and staying engaged throughout. Of course, I have to give a shout out to my counterpart here in Washington, Ambassador Lazarus Amayo, uh, who is my senior in diplomacy, and his deputy uh, uh, David Gasheru, Ambassador David Gasheru, and thank you all. Um, you know. We all know that Africa needs to tell its story more. We all know that there's so much more happening that is positive and even transformative on the continent. And the question, I think, is why is there a persistence, a persistence continuity of this narrative of helplessness? And I, th I think that has some form of structural life now. It's not just ignorance. It's a, it's a way in which Africa is positioned in global affairs. And it's, 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 it's been centuries in the making. And it's going to be some time before we emerge fully from it. But in the process of emerging from it, I think we can embrace how dramatic a, change, a shift there has been in Africa. If you look at um, our demography, for instance, a hundred years ago, there were just over a hundred million Africans on the on the on the continent. Uh, in 20 years or so, in just under 30 years, in 2050, uh, they're going to be two and a half billion. Uh, this is a sea change in terms of demography, but it's not just numbers. It's the youthfulness of those numbers. And the youthfulness expressing such a diversity of cultural um, intelligence um, that is expressed in the arts, in the way people live, in the way they express themselves, in the way they practice religion. So this huge energy on the ground is going to make Africa a pivotal force in the 21st century. And our work as policymakers, and this generation of policymakers, is to ensure that that incredible energy is translated into an unstoppable Africa that is unstoppable in the, in the, to the extent of its economic development, uh, in its projection and, and um, export of peace and security into the world. 
for it to be a major pole of global economic growth, for it to lead in the energy transition and climate change responsibility. I think we're headed in that direction, but we have some considerable challenges to take care of in the meantime. And because those challenges are significant and cannot be wished away, there will be some aspect of a continued negative narrative. But for those of us who are committed to Africa, as Africans who are committed friends of Africa, we have to look beyond that and see what could be. If we cannot see what could be and what is coming, we will not have the energy and the conviction to push forward. Ambassador, you spoke very eloquently to this issue of African youth demographic and what does it really mean for the continent. And I'm glad to see some African youth in the audience today. Well, many of us consider ourselves African youth, <laughs> but some real African youth in the audience. Do you get a sense from African young people that they feel this degree of optimism, or do you pick up a greater sense of either resignation or pulling back and just operating outside of government and outside of politics because they don't see that changing fast enough or meeting their aspirations? Well, um, I, I don't want to make any blanket uh, sort of assessment. I, haven't, I, I don't have the, the tools to, to, to answer that question comprehensively. But I do know there is impatience. There is impatience. There's impatience with economic models that do not, are not inclusive enough. There's impatience because young people have, broadly speaking, um, um, carried out their end of the deal. And the deal as I was growing up was go to school, finish school, and we will have opportunity waiting for you. Well, in Kenya and in other countries, our young people have done that. They've gone to school, they've gotten educated, they've gotten skills, they have ambition and they want to work. Now they're looking to us to say, okay, I did my part. And I think our last election, which I think was a, was a great victory for Kenyan democracy, uh, demonstrated that our political leadership is listening and President Ruto was actually elected on the platform of listening to those young people who were saying this model of trickle-down economics is not working for us. And I was very interested the other day, a few days ago, when I saw President Biden tweet that the, the trickle-down model uh, has failed for the last 50 years, uh, which then means that President Biden and President Ruto uh, are solidly in the same camp in terms of an economics that is speaking to the people at the bottom and is built from the bottom upwards rather than from the top downwards. If we can do that, and that is something that each country needs to do but cannot do it alone, um, then we shall begin to address the impatience of young Africans. Well, since you brought President Biden to the conversation, let's have a conversation about the Biden administration's views on Africa. Um, the administration seems to have been embracing recently um, the, the counter-narrative. The 2022 Africa strategy, the U.S. Africa strategy, seeks to, as they say, reframe the region's importance to U.S. national security interests. And Secretary um, Blinken traveled to Nigeria last year, and he, he was quoted as saying, Africa will shape the future not just the future of African people, but of the world. And then he traveled further to Pretoria, and he said, Sub-Saharan Africa is a major geopolitical force, one that shaped our past, is shaping our present, and will shape our future. How do you see this reframing of the relationship that the President, the President Biden's administration is putting forward? And do you see that the statements are being matched by real partnership efforts on the ground? Uh, well, you know, I think there's somebody in Washington listening and there's somebody in Washington reaching out and it, I think it is appreciated uh, because um, understanding for Washington to understand the immensity of what Africa is in terms of the opportunity for the whole world, including for the United States, is key. But there's something very important to realize, which is you use the word unstoppable Africa. Um, it takes, it's taken me a while to internalize um, what it means to have two and a half billion people, to increase one and a half billion people in 20, the next 20 something years. It means that the velocity of change is such that the strategies the United States employs and any other country need to be deeply responsive to our own African strategies because the, the velocity is beyond any one country's ability 
to divert, to control, or to in any way uh, manage. What is really required is the strength of partnership. And that's what I saw in the, in the, in the Biden strat strategy for Africa. It has an appetite for partnership. It has an appetite for listening. And I think that part about listening is something that the Biden administration has brought, I think, very clearly. And I've seen Secretary Blinken in his engagements and my counterpart in Washington, uh, uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, really internalizing that. Now, the question is, what are we Africans going to say? What are we going to put forward as our priorities? Um, how convinced are we that those are the right priorities? So there's a, there's a lot of the challenge on our side of the fence as well, so that the Biden administration can have the credible partners that it needs to build a strong partnership. Thank you for that. Um, can I talk a little bit about um, this global power competition that we, we, we all know is out there? Um, I've heard many African leaders say, we have lots of development partners. We don't want to get caught up in this global power competition. China was a good development partner for Africa in many ways. Um, there's also the sense that there are alternative venues for Africa to organize and to find its aspirations. BRICS is one of them, and there are others. And so this global competition issue, which is sort of in the strategy as well, it's spoken to in the strategy, comes out very clearly. How do you see the US competing better in Africa so that it's not a choice of one development partner or the other, but that, that Africa can have many development partners and the U.S. can be a better competitor in that process. How do you see that developing? Uh, well, I think we need to get out of the frame of uh, competition because competition inevitably leads to competitive feeling and competitive feeling inevitably leads to rivalry and rivalry inevitably leads to conflict. And I think Africa has experienced rivalry by superpowers. What was called a Cold War in Washington was experienced as a series of hot wars in Africa. We do not want that. We do not want to be forced into taking sides. We've taken our own side, and that side is a side seeking development, peace, and security. So we will work with the partners who help us achieve what our side needs. Now, what, why it's so important to get out of the framing of competition is because so much of enmity depends on you creating your own enemy. And where the, when I watch the engagements in the UN Security Council, it becomes clear that there is emerging not just competition, but rivalry. And that that rivalry sometimes will seek to engage other countries as proxies to express itself, especially when one's rival is nuclear armed. So I think Africa's position has been no thanks. We have too much on our plate to get caught in major power rivalries. Now saying that and doing it is two different things. And I think Markela was to say, to talk about the African Union peace and security architecture, it assumes in some implicit way that its internal focus on settling crises in Africa, repudiating coup d'etats, uh, mediating peace, it assumes that the global environment is stable. I believe in the coming years, Africa will need to add a plank to its external engagements to its external strategic conversations where Africa will need to insist on a stable global order. Africa will need to see that it has equities in the European security order because when the broken European security order is leading directly to suffering in Africa, it's leading to the growth of potential conflicts that could affect Africa. So it is for Africa to tell Europe, not in a negative way, your security order is broken. You need to fix it. Now, that shouldn't be hard for them to take because they tell us that all the time. <laughs> so I think we need to make this point, and I think we need to make it in a positive way. And we need to offer ourselves. I have come to understand that Africans are very talented listeners, 
and in mediation. And when I saw Chairman Musafaki and the President of Senegal, the chairperson of our, of, of our union, fly to Moscow, I think they should continue. They should continue engaging because we have a stake in a stable global order. We have a stake in a rules-based multilateral system. I want to come to that issue, um, but before we get there, I want to just go back a little bit more and talk about the U.S.-African diaspora, because clearly they have a role to play. Do you see the U.S. diaspora being um, one of the competitive edges that we have in dealing with African governments, dealing with African issues? I actually think that was the most uh, brilliant part of the Biden-Africa strategy. I don't know any other country outside the United States that has as accomplished, uh, as connected uh, an African diaspora as the United States. And I'm counting not just the Africans, uh, Dr. Sani, who left Africa recently. I'm talking about African Americans and uh, the fact that this diaspora um, has all the skills, has the capital, uh, and has the desire to connect with Africa. Uh, and I, th I think the strategy leveraging that um, and the actions it takes to leverage that will place the United States in a very strong position to add value to itself and, and to Africa. And one has to say that one notices, I have to say, a lot of our, our Nigerian brothers and sisters in the, in the Biden administration. And, and I think how much more powerful can, can, can your policy making be than to have a deep, familiar understanding of Africa while you're an American official. I, I think that is going to pay a great deal of dividends. I appreciate that you recognize the historic diaspora and the recent diaspora, because you're right, they both lend a, a credence and a value to um, US-Africa engagement. So I'm glad that you, you underscore that. And I claim myself as part of that historic diaspora. And when I serve in Africa and work in Africa, it's very much a real sense of I have a connectivity here as well. So I appreciate that. You know, the, the African Union Constitutive Act um, recognizes the African diaspora. But we had not politicized this sufficiently. We, we sort of thought of it as sort of reaching out. But if, if you really uh, see what has happened for, in the Security Council, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the smallest, uh, smallest population to ever serve in the Security Council, came on and, and their Prime Minister Gonzalez said that they would, they would take the position of the African Union. So if the other three African members were united on an issue, St. Vincent would stand with them. In the Security Council, the difference between three and four is exponential. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a massive difference. And what that meant is that the A3 plus one showed in real time in the, in the most august diplomatic body in terms of peace and security what Africa and its diaspora can do at a po geopolitical level. Mm -hmm. Now there's a growing appetite between CARICOM and Africa mm -hmm. to work together. There's a new c a candidacy coming up uh, by Guyana in June. I would imagine they'll get every single African vote. Uh, I, 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 and I think that they will come onto the council and they themselves may choose to also be part of an A3 plus one. I think it is a significant development. Ambassador Kimani, you're anticipating all of my areas of inquiry because <laughs> I'm going right where you're going now. Let's talk about multilateralism in, in Africa. Um, we all know that when the UN and the Bretton Woods institutions were created, Africa was pretty much under colonial domination. And so there really wasn't a voice. With independence, Africa got a bit of a voice, but a voice in a non-permanent role in the Security Council and a no veto role in the Security Council. And that reality exists to this day. And of course, there's been a lot of call and a lot of discussion about changing that in Security Council reform. Then you look at what's happening with the P5 today. You look at Russia being able to block Security Council actions, and then that action moving from the Security Council to General Assembly, where with 193 members, everybody has a say, an equal say, and Africa suddenly has a, an enormous voice in that body of the UN General Assembly. So the first question I would want to ask you is, what is the current state of discussion around Security Council reform as it involves Africa? And I can't help but note that um, President Biden has called for a permanent seat for Africa. 
Um, Secretary General Gutierrez has called for a permanent seat. The Japanese Prime Minister has called for it. And of course, Africans have long been um, very clear on this position that Africa must have a permanent seat. Where is that discussion now, if it's happening at all? Well, um, we have to, without making this a history sort of uh, uh, lecture of any kind, uh, the Security Council exists as both an expression of the Charter, the UN Charter, and as a political settlement between the victors of a great war. And the, the members who have permanent status, uh, permanent membership in the Security Council um, in 1945 were, uh, were at the top and had defeated uh, Nazi, the Nazis and their allies and had suffered a great deal doing so. Uh, the Soviet Union, for instance, I think, paid an exceptional price in defeating um, Nazism. So the Security Council was born from crisis. And I think there's a very good chance that it will change because of crisis. And the question is, the crises that we are in now and the crises that we have gone through, are they sufficient? I would like to think, yes, they are. Uh, and that the, mem the permanent five will find it in their interest to expand the body because it needs more balance. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. The two years or so that we've been in the Security Council have convinced me that whoever made non-permanent membership two, two years was very clever. Uh, they were very clever in seeking to limit the, the, the leverage and the, and the, and the influence of the elected members. Because just as you understand it, it's time to go. <laughs> so uh, one of the reasons Africa needs to sit on the council with a permanent seat is because of continuity of effort. Africa has a lot to protect. Africa may not be part of great power war. We wouldn't be in the council so as to prevent us fighting someone else. Right now, the P5, it's designed that way to supposedly stop the Third World War between the great powers. But Africa would be there to protect itself and others who have a weaker voice in global governance. It means that to have sovereignty of our natural resources, to have the ability to resist uh, being utilized as proxies, to have hostile and malign actors uh, turning against us against one another, uh, in search of our natural and human resources, we need to sit there every single day and understand what is going on every single day with the same institutional memory and political leverage as the most powerful. Makila, we've moved now, I think, from the age of noblesse oblige, you know, the, what is the responsibility of the most powerful, to an age where we understand that that is not sufficient. We need inclusion because we need to be in the room to protect our interests. And our ability to protect our interests as Africa is actually of benefit to global peace and security. And I think the argument has been made. I think it needs to be made more strongly. And I, for one, and I think all my African colleagues in New York very much appreciated President Biden's uh, announcement and uh, Minister Lavrov's repost to that announcement by also saying that the Russian Federation is open to that membership. Everyone says they're open to that membership. Mm. Everyone supports Africa, but somehow it doesn't, uh, mm. it hasn't yet happened. Mm. So I think we're going to need to push further and I hope it's not going to take a more profound crisis for that to happen. When I worked in the State Department, one of the jobs I had was serving in the office that covers Africa in the Security Council. And I thought, oh, it'll be once a week, I'll have something to do. Every day, Africa's in the Security Council, every day on some matter or the other. So I absolutely agree that that permanency would respect the, the, the demand of the work and the demand of the issues that are, that are attended to there. Can I ask you, though, about the Security Council? In, in fact, sorry, Makila, the, 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 the reforms that would change the world the most are reforms within Africa itself. If the Peace and Security Council and the African Union Commission and the regional organizations continue in the trend that they're in now, I think the Secur UN Security Council will become a very sleepy place because the conflicts will be solved in Africa. And right there, 60% or 70% of what the Security Council does 
will be taken off the table. Yes. They'll meet once a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we talk a little bit about what's happening, this new dynamic we see where things that aren't be, being addressed in the Security Council are moving to the General Assembly? I think the Ukraine crisis has been the most recent example, but there may be others. Can you tell me um, what is happening with this notion that maybe when there's a veto in the Security Council, the General Assembly is going to take it up? Um, I've, seen, I've seen indication that that's where things are going. Is that really the new reality? Yes, uh, you're describing the veto initiative, which is uh, Resolution 262. Uh, it's a resolution that passed a few uh, months ago, and Kenya was one of the countries that championed uh, that resolution. And what, it, what, what it, it, it basically says is that when there's a veto in by, when there's a negative vote, a no vote, which is a veto by a permanent member, then the President of the General Assembly within 10 days will schedule a debate of the General Assembly. And, and, and that has happened several times. And what that does is that it gives the membership a chance to speak to the veto. And it raises uh, uh, the difficulty of using the veto because after you use it, you have to come to, 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 the, to the General Assembly. Now, 262 is right at the beginning of its application. I think it's going to, over time, become a very powerful vehicle for the General Assembly mm -hmm. because the General Assembly never gave away all its powers to engage on peace and security issues. It retained that ability. Mm -hmm. But the Security Council has been mandated to lead in that direction. But if the Security Council is unable to deliver on its mandate, then the General Assembly over time may begin to assert itself in ways that I cannot anticipate right now. So that resolution, which was uh, um, uh, drafted and pushed initially by Liechtenstein, I think is going to be a historic reform to the United Nations. Well, if you're in a venue where numbers is the game, it's definitely going to be a historic change for Africa, which has a large number in the General Assembly. So we will stay tuned and keep an eye on that. You can imagine, for instance, the General Assembly sending back, um, voting to send a resolution and sending uh, a, a, the sec a back a resolution back to the Security Council and saying, we think that uh, whatever you did with this resolution was not effective. Please relook at it. Uh, that sets up for some, a degree of legal, legal complications, Absolutely, it does. Uh, but then it really shines a torch on, on the veto. The veto is a, is a critical, is an, is a, is an important tool, um, but it has become a tool that is, rather than pursuing the responsibility that members of the P5 has, has become an expression of their, of their national interest, far too much so. Mm -hmm. You mentioned another interesting dynamic that's happening. This has been a long-standing process, but, but coming to the fore now, and that's the A3, the three members of the African, um, three African states on the Security Council, and working with the Caribbean and Latin America. You mentioned um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm also interested in Haiti, because Haiti has, of course, been in the Council in discussions, and what's happening in Haiti with the security crisis is of great concern to so many. How is Africa coordinating in the Security Council with um, other regions, particularly to address questions like uh, peace and security in Haiti? Uh, thank you. I'm, you know, Kenya, uh, when we got on the council, one of the things we wanted to do was to reach out at a, on a global level with a conviction that African lives, wherever they are, matter to Kenya uh, and that the African diaspora uh, must be part of Kenya's attention. And so on engaging on the files in, that are in, the, uh, in the Security Council, one of them is Haiti and the other one is Colombia. In Colombia, Kenya has pushed hard to foreground the issue of how Afro-Colombians are treated in the peace process and that Afro the, con the economic and political condition of Afro-Colombians is a good indicator of the inclusiveness and the effectiveness of the um, implementation of the peace process. And uh, in Haiti, uh, our conviction uh, from the start is that Haiti is a special country to the world. Uh, 
we all know the history, but for Haiti to have overcome, overthrown slavery, uh, defeated the great powers of the day in defense of their freedom, means that Haiti stood as a shining beacon of African freedom and independence. And any Pan-Africanist in the world embraces Haiti. So the, the crisis going on in Haiti now is a painful one for Kenya and for the A, A3 in general. Last year, during our presidency of the Security Council, we pledged a few thousand positions in our training institutions uh, for Haitians, and we're still looking forward to fulfilling that, that pledge. Now, this situation is um, extremely negative in terms of the uh, extreme food insecurity, the lack of energy, the violence, the gangs, which in some way uh, are, um, should be properly thought of as malicious, as opposed to just gangs, um, has led the Security Council to pay attention, and we recently passed a resolution on sanctions. Now that resolution passed 15-0 unanimously, meaning that it brought the Security Council to unite on this issue, which has, is something notable in the environment we're in. The A3 was quite instrumental in that because um, there was, we want, it wanted there to be a review mechanism to make sure that these sanctions do not end up saddling with Haiti with years of sanctions, even as they try and improve their governance. Sanctions are easy to put on, very difficult to take off. And so we put in a review mechanism. Had we not insisted on that review mechanism, a number of countries would have abstained on the vote, and overall it would have been a less legitimate exercise of Security Council power. And that is important because the, from my listening, the people of Haiti are extremely um, worried and cautious about external intervention. They want to know, okay, this latest act from outside, is it for us or is it the expression of experiences we've had in the past that we don't want any more of? And so it was very important for it to pass with that kind of um, unanimity. And we continue to hope that we can do as much as we can to support Haiti during this time. And again, if you say on the numbers, three it's not as powerful as four, and four is a great number for Africa and, and the regions of the Caribbean and Latin America to be working together on, so interested to hear that. Um, on this reform question, though, you didn't give me a fuller answer on whether things are really gonna be moving in the short term. Do you see things happening in the short term on the reform issue? Because if not, the Security Council seems like it's becoming more and more irrelevant to bringing about peace and security. Is it happening in the short term? Uh, well, it should be in the short term, in the next two months, so we can just stay on. <laughs> But um, that's with a light touch. Uh, the, you know, I think Security Council reform is going to happen slowly and then very quickly. What I mean by that is that uh, when I speak to veterans of Security Council reform, they're almost all uniformly pessimistic. I am a recent convert. I think they're far too pessimistic. Mm. I think right now, if the, if the war in Ukraine continues, if the trends we're seeing continue, uh, I think the, the appetite for reform is going to grow. Um, and I think few of the P5 members will want to be seen globally as being uh, opposed to change because they don't really have an argument about how effective or, or the, the, the body is being. And I think they will begin to understand that we are, they are, the Security Council is sliding towards irrelevance the f more this continues. So I, I, I hope, I, I am optimistic that it will happen, but I don't know if it's going to happen within a, a three-year time frame or a five-year time frame. I would think so. But my, my chief worry is that the appetite for pain by the P5 is so much that it would have to be a much greater crisis mm. for them to truly uh, embrace rapid change. I, I really hope that they are responsible enough to, to not need that to happen. 
Well, let's talk about one of the crises du jour at the Security Council, and that is Ukraine. Um, we've seen that there have been about three votes taken in the UN General Assembly. In March, there were a couple, there were two, there was one in October, and in all of those votes, the, the clear indication is that Africa is very split. Um, I think it was like 40, 40, and, and then there were some abstentions and people who didn't vote at all. And so you see that Africa is clearly split on this question. Then you see countries like the US and France encouraging, trying to get African countries to be standing in solidarity with Ukraine. You see the Ukrainian foreign minister going to Africa for the first time ever, I believe, the Ukrainian president reaching out to the African Union. Clearly, there's a strong push to get Africa to support Ukraine in the General Assembly and in the UN Security Council. But that's one side of the coin. The other side is that many African states have long-term historical relationships with, with Russia, and most recently, security and economic relationships. And for those countries, I think they take the approach of our vote is based on the fact that we have, it's in our national interest to not necessarily disalign with, with, with Russia. So the question I'd like to ask is, for the countries in Africa who feel this is a new Cold War, why should we get drawn into this? What do you say? What is your response? You spoke eloquently in February, but watching the continuing developments, where do you see this issue going for Africa? Well, Kenya's, uh, Kenya's statement in February and subsequent statements have, have been statements uh, that reflect our adherence to the UN Charter to the principle of sovereignty and territorial integrity. We were not taking that position to side against anyone or with, we were taking that position to side with multilateralism and with our principles uh, and, and with the UN Charter. And of course, we felt deeply for the people in the country of Ukraine, um, where the breach of the Charter has led to a devastating war and their great suffering. And the solution needs to be in accord with the UN Charter. Having said that, we're also very clear as Kenya that the war needs to end. At some point, there's going to be a negotiating table. Whether now or later, whether immediately or after many more die and much more destruction is created. There is going to be that negotiating table. And the question is, what is going to be discussed at that negotiating table? The war in Ukraine will be addressed. The broader ramifications and causes of that war will have to be addressed. And the European security order will have to be reset and stabilized with a series of guarantees and agreements. This is very clear. The continuation of the war is endangering us in terms of its escalation, including the use of weapons of mass destruction, continuing economic turmoil that is affecting the whole world, uh, and most importantly, the continuing gross suffering of Ukrainian people. So I think the African countries, and I don't want to speak for Africa on this one, because I think each African state has assessed the situation from its own perspective. And everybody I know, every diplomat I know, when they explain what they're doing, they start by asking, what do our people need right now? You see, once, once a political leader asks that, uh, you know, uh, their answer now, you can only try and you know, massage their answer because they've put where they stand. So, there are those like Kenya that have made a position for the UN Charter. There are those who have abstained, and there are those who have opposed the condemnation of the invasion. And in all of those are informed by their interests. But the one common interest that all of us have is in the end of this war. There is no military solution. There really isn't. And um, I think that is slowly going to be understood more and the African position on that is, needs to be clarified. On t in terms of the pressures by different major powers on African voting, I have to say that I am pleased by um, that African countries have been given their space to make up their mind. Not that long ago, 
there was a policy that if you vote against, uh, mm. <laughs> if, you, if you're in New York and you vote against uh, a, a very powerful country, that you will pay. Mm. Yeah, it was expressed openly yes. and was expressed actually as a policy. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't work well. And I think the, the, the present approach of, yes, we know that the, the United States would rather every African country strongly condemn the Russian Federation. But I think, if, to go back to where you started, what President Biden has, has said, what President, uh, Secretary Blinken has been talking about, means that they're listening and, I think, understanding when African countries abstain. It's not against Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's really an attempt to serve your own people in one way or another. This war, for instance, is leading to blockages in fertilizer supplies. Mm -hmm. There are no sanctions against fertilizers, but different countries, because of their relationship to Russia, are choosing to use transport routes, transit routes, to apply sort of pressures uh, in official and unofficial ways. You know, what we call non-tariff barriers, you know, those, those ones that are there, but they're not there officially. Um, we need those to, to move because for us, fertilizer is not because we want to fund the war. We want to, to uh, put any more pressure on, Ukra on Ukraine. It is because if we do not plant with fertilizer in quarter one and quarter two next year, we're going to have starvation in several countries. We cannot afford that. Uh, so there are real uh, issues on the ground that need solving. And I think there are people in Washington trying to solve those, but they need to drill down deeper uh, and get those bottlenecks to, to food fertilizer out of the way. You're making a very clear and compelling case for why this war has to end and its impact on Africa, on food security, on fertilizer. That's very clear. The other issue that people see that the war is doing is taking attention away from African crises on the continent. Is the council paying enough attention to African security threats at the moment? Are they, as they say, um, sufficiently seized of the matter to look at what's happening in Africa? Africa has quite a lot of security challenges that have been long-standing that haven't gone away before the Ukraine war and will be there most likely after the Ukraine war. Um, I, I'm not completely opposed to some degree of lower attention towards us. Uh, because high, uh, ex, uh, intense attention towards Africa has often reduced African policy space and, 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 and in some way pushed in the opposite direction to African agency. Uh, it's our continent. These are our countries. We have to solve these problems primarily. Uh, the Security Council, yes, has, is, has been deeply affected uh, by the war in Ukraine. And that has become the primary driver of the dynamics in the Security Council. I think this offers the African Union Peace and Security Council, regional organizations, whether it's ECOWAS, whether it's the East African community, an opportunity to show our responsibility and our competence. There's a lot, there's further we can go, but if you look at the African Union mediated process, in Ethiopia. That was an African solution to an African challenge, with the support of others. But it took a while. But Africa, yesterday or the day before, was able to deliver a cessation of hostilities, which gives us an opportunity to build on that and gives Ethiopia an opportunity to come back and stabilize itself uh, and, and stop the carnage. If you look at the East African community's initiatives, uh, initiative for Eastern, stabilizing Eastern Congo, uh, along with the Angola process, uh, and you look at ECOWAS's positions on unconstitutional changes of government, I think Africa is standing up and being counted when it comes to engaging on very complex and difficult issues. Where the Security Council, I think, should pay more attention is on how Africa on how to combat and minimize the threat of Al-Qaeda groups uh, in the Sahel, in the Horn of Africa, in Southern Africa. That is a matter of high priority, not just in terms of the military aspect of it, 
but the economic and political package that needs to accompany that. And I would note that this month, Ghana has the presidency, and I understand that Ghana is actually put on the agenda that very topic of looking at violent extremist groups and looking at peace and security broadly in Africa. So it will get its attention this month at least, so I'm glad to hear that that's going to be happening. Um, can I turn in the last few minutes that I have, because I'm eager to give you over to this audience, um, I want to talk a little bit about the U.S.-Africa relationship and the U.S.-Africa summit that's coming up in December. It's been announced by the Biden administration. There's great expectation. There are high hopes. The strategy strategy is out now. We've talked about the strategy. Um, tell me what you think would be some of the most meaningful outcomes of the summit. Um, how can the administration deliver on the promises of the strategy? What do you see about that around in that whole constellation of this is Africa's moment right now in Washington? Well, many African countries are going, uh, are, are trying to navigate very, very challenging times. Um, there's squeezed fiscal space, uh, the flow of investments uh, globally in emerging markets, not just in Africa, is reversing itself and uh, investors are looking for safety because of the volatility of the global environment. Uh, uh, the raising of US interest rates, the raising of interest rates in the major economies, all means that there's more money leaving emerging markets, heading back to developed markets. Uh, the, Extreme weather patterns, whether it's uh, the Horn of Africa suffering its greatest drought in 40 years, to biblical mm. floods all over the world, uh, means that um, it is increasingly difficult to drive development. Now you're trying to ensure survival, recovery, rebuilding, not even uh, development, growth. So in a country like Kenya, we have to simultaneously uh, deliver on food security while we're delivering on getting Google to set up offices in the same country. Mm -hmm. We have to do two things at the same time, or actually several things. So I think the meeting in December, whatever its normative conversation, I'm sure we will talk about democracy. I am sure we will talk about human rights and, and, and rule of law. These are critical. But f I think for it to truly emerge as, um, as a significant success, the leaders need to go back home with something that they can say our conversation with the United States is going to lead to us being able to do more to deal with the emergencies and the need for opportunity. I, um, I don't, I, I'm not sure where the debate is amongst the African group in Washington, but I would imagine that they're pushing for a tangible um, agreement, uh, tangible in the lives of people. And I think uh, the Biden administration is in a great position, I think, to show leadership in that, in, in delivering in that. Well, we've got some representatives of the administration here. I think they're taking notes. Very good, very good to hear that. <laughs> the last question I have for you, sir, is about the, um, the, the climate change conference that's going on right now in Egypt. It started this week, COP27, the Africa Climate Change Summit. Um, we know that one of the big issues for Africa has been the need for financing from rich countries, major polluters, to address loss and damage to poor countries. Um, that's been a demand, that's been a, a discussion point, and I just don't know really where it's going. How do you see that conversation? Do you think that that's something that's going to come out of this conference? Are you hopeful about that? What do you see that? Oh man, my, this one is a difficult one. Um, I have to say, Glasgow last year was, was quite disappointing, to say the least. Uh, we heard a lot about um, the need to transition to renewables. There was pressure put by the richest countries to, to slow or stop new investments in fossil fuel uh, 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 developments in Africa and, and in developing countries. And uh, now all that has changed. Uh, the richest countries are busy expanding fossil fuel use because of their energy crisis. Uh, so it's one more illustration of the strange um, two-lane, double-standard multilateralism we live with. Um, the truth is that Africa is energy poor, and the truth is that energy is not just a component of development. Energy is the, ex is the driver 
of human flourishing. And if you do not have um, energy security, if you do not have sufficient and affordable energy, you cannot but live in grinding poverty. It's that simple. And Africa will need energy. We'll need it to overcome poverty, to, pr to give real food security, um, and to transition to a green economy. And so in Egypt, I think the African position is going to be strong and insistent on energy justice. And I have to say that because we're talking about the Biden ad administration strategy, that phrase, energy justice, in that, in that strategy is very welcome. Now let's act on it. How do we, we will have to understand that Africans will have to exploit fossil fuel to a certain extent. Where Kenya is concerned, we have pledged to move our electricity supply to 100% renewable mm -hmm. by 2030. The total energy we will need going forward, we will need very heavy investments to sustain that if we're going to industrialize, right? So I think the ball is in the court of the most developed countries. They have to decide whether to meet uh, their Paris obligations that they themselves uh, signed up to. Uh, they're going to need on a unilateral level to decide what they're going to do with technology transfer to enable investment, not just aid, but investment in our transition. And Kenya is waiting. Kenya is right now, our renewables, uh, use of renewables, one of the highest in the world. I think it's over 90%. And we're being able to provide 80, over 80% 80 of our citizens with electricity. And we're doing that as re with renewables. So we are ready to take off and drive this process, but we need the United States to partner with us and to show tangibly that our commitment to getting there by 2030 will be met by investment and technology transfer. Ambassador Kimani, thank you so much for that. Those were the easy questions. Ah. Now I'm going to turn you over to the audience that have a few more questions for you. Um, if you would please acknowledge your um, who you are when you ask your question, and try to make them rather brief. We have about 15 minutes. We'd love to get some questions from the floor. <coughs> I can't believe you've answered all the questions. Um, we have a mic, we have, here we have Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Ambassador. My name is uh, Lazarus Kapambwe. I'm the ambassador of Zambia here. And I just wanted to pick up on one point which you made about the need to listen and hoping that uh, in the strategy of the United States, being able to listen is one of the most important things that uh, they can do. And it reminds me of what we say in my country, especially when you talk about Security Council reform. In my country, there is a saying that wisdom moves from an anthill into the mountain. The presence of Africa in the Security Council, in the permanent category, will infuse some of this wisdom. For example, when we talk about conflict resolution, you have just cited the Ethiopian uh, case. There are many others that happen and the Security Council doesn't even know about it because we settle a lot more conflicts on the continent outside the view of the United Nations Security Council. So 
it is important for us to have space there. One of the ideas that uh, the United Nations Security Council and the UN in general has not picked up on, but which was initiated by Africa in 2000, is the issue of unconstitutional changes of government, which is now in the Constitutive Act. The idea of Africa was that that principle be made a global principle, that it be incorporated by the United Nations. And if it had, many of the conflicts, uh, many of the cool deters that we are talking about around the world would not be permitted by the United Nations. And that would act as a sufficient deterrent. When in 2000, this principle was incorporated by the African Union, we saw a big drop, in fact, to zero unconstitutional changes of government in Africa. But when the United Nations resisted, up to now, the big powers have not come out in support of that principle, which means after some time, people realized that, yes, you can be ostracized in the African Union, but you will still be embraced by the United Nations. And so they saw no appetite, and now we are seeing an increase in unconstitutional changes of, Afri uh, you know, uh, of uh, governments in Africa itself. Because they know they can do it, even if the African Union ostracizes them for one, one year, they will still be at the United Nations. And the major resistors of incorporating that principle are the members of the P5. I do hope that the United States can come out strongly in support of incorporating that principle within the United Nations. Because once that is done, it will be a sufficient deterrent to unconstitutional changes of government across not only Africa, but across uh, the world. Thank you. Ambassador, do you care to respond? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Kapambwe, and uh, you're the namesake of my uh, colleague, uh, Lazarus. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and congratulations on Zambia's uh, election and its very dynamic government. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, I think, speaks for all of us in the pursuit of development and investment. Um, on uh, wisdom moves from an anthill into a mountain. You know, uh, this say you say makes me br brings to to the fore of my mind um, that Africa's practices of mediation and peace building are actually forms of very powerful t cultural technology. And uh, since we are in the building for peace, I think there's so much to be researched on practices of peace in Africa because I think they're unique. The role of peers. Um, the, the power of ostracism. Um, in, in many of our cultures, being banished is possibly the worst thing. It's a form of social death mm -hmm. uh, and cultural death. So when the African Union says you cannot sit with us, it is a far more painful thing than many people realize. Uh, we're sitting here, you have to stay outside. Uh, and even if you can come to New York, you still will feel it. Um, but you're right, Ambassador Kapambwe, that the Constitutive Act's ambition is not just within Africa, but I think that has been forgotten more than it should. For Kenya, in the Security Council, we condemned the coup d'etat, the unconstitutional change of government in Myanmar on the basis of our Constitutive Act. Our reasoning was, if this is a standard we hold for ourselves, well, then we hold it for you too. Right? We, we, I can't help it. Um, if I'm at the center of my own universe, then the way I live, I want to see, not, not to impose, but it, 
sets my expectations. Um, I do think that unconstitutional changes of government can be threats to international peace and security. What is happening now is potentially ri risky. One is that Africa creates a strong position against an unconstitutional change of government. Then that is brought to the Security Council, and the Security Council is asked to condemn the unconstitutional change of government. Now, the A3 need to navigate this very carefully because you do not want the Security Council to have different principles for Africans and for non-Africans. Mm -hmm. We cannot be party to our own creation of double standards. So the A3 and Africa needs to either push for this to be a norm of the United Nations for everybody, or our actions stop in the African Union. It's very, there's a difference, because what the Security Council would do is willingly um, create an instrument for Africa and not for others. And then in the politics of the Security Council, that instrument will not always be used in the defense of African constitutionalism. So we have, in the Security Council, Africans do two things, which is to advance our interests and two, to defend our independence. Uh, now, that is not a sufficient answer. It's only a holding position. The true answer we need to work for is to make unconstitutional changes of government be something that the United Nations rejects. And wherever it happens, uh, uh, it, it, uh, it's condemned and an action is taken. And we have now learned that it can happen anywhere. There, there are no constitutional institutions or processes that cannot be undermined or destroyed by political actors with the power and the will to do so. Can we try to get another question in before our time runs out, sir? Please identify yourself. Thank you so much, Ambassador Kimani. My name is Francis Boglan from the Ghana Embassy. Uh, I have something to uh, talk about which relates to food insecurity on the continent. Ambassador Kimani, can you share with us your ideas and suggestions as to how Africa can address this issue in a sustainable manner? Uh, if you consider the fact that uh, the continent is a continent that should be feeding itself, and yet we still have issues of food insecurity. This is a very major issue. And what are, are we doing as a continent to be so self-sustaining uh, when it comes to food? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Francis. I, I'm not a, an expert on agricultural uh, issues. Uh, and your question is very focused. Let me perhaps expand it just slightly, on, and that is the relationship between the Security Council and the food insecurity. What is happening is that the Security Council is spending more and more of its time debating and engaging on humanitarian issues. And that's partly a reflection of the fact that it's having a much harder time moving on the political issues. It's much harder to reach political settlements than it is to navigate humanitarian access and, and uh, in terms of food security, especially in situations of conflict. And so this is an opportunity, I think. One is that there seems to be a humanitarian, humanitarian exception within conflict areas. Uh, co determined conflict uh, parties who are fighting each other appear to only be able at this point to appreciate humanitarian engagement as the most legitimate, th as the only thing they're willing to accept from the outside world. That is what delivered the Black Sea Green Initiative. The two times when the United Nations has succeeded in the Ukraine conflict in bringing the two sides together was the evacuation of uh, civilians from Mariupol for humanitarian reasons and uh, the Black Sea Green Initiative. And that was because both Ukraine and the Russian Federation were willing to say that the movement of grain and fertilizer from Ukraine and from Russia was a global good in terms of humanitarian outcomes. What can we do further with this? I think we need to link humanitarian initiatives with peace building better. 
the humanitarians open an opportunity, and I think peace builders and mediators need to work with that opportunity better. I also uh, believe that um, uh, development agencies and humanitarian agencies need to work more closely together because we're in situations of prolonged humanitarian crisis. So the food insecurity in Africa is not going to be solved tomorrow. So we're going to need to have better linkages. Francis, at the end, we're going to need to raise our productivity. Africa has the largest amount of arable land that is not presently under agriculture. We have a population in the rural areas. We have people who need food. All the elements are there. there you can create offtake agreements for wheat imports and, and invest technologically uh, in, in wheat growing areas in Africa. There are farmers in Africa growing wheat. wheat. From Southern, the whole of Southern Africa is a wheat growing, uh, it's wheat growing potential, can feed the world. So this uh, coming summit, can we create a linkage that brings together the, the wheat importers in Africa with the wheat producers and to scale wheat production to get that offtake agreement in Africa. The rice that West Africans are growing, Nigerians, Kenyans are here importing rice. Can we do the same? Can we do bulk purchases of fertilizer together? Can we build fertilizer production plants like Dangote has done, but several of them across Africa, so that Africa is getting cheap fertilizer and I think also sustainable green fertilizer for itself. So Francis, to answer your question, uh, the answer to your question is the answer to bring development and jobs to Africa. And we have to see it, and you didn't ask it this way, I don't want to put words in your mouth. It's not just a question of get the food aid to the people, but rather to answer it by making smart and significant investments in African food production uh, for African markets. Now, if that's the kind of thing that can emerge in December or closely following on December, then it will have the most tangible impact on African people's lives. And I have to take advantage of a question to remember that the single most impactful American policy that I can remember was PEPFAR. That once all the geopolitics are done and said, what really moves the ball is touching as many African lives as you can through policy. And I think that's in the area of food security is the area today that is most, uh, most important. And a lot of, and that will also speak to the geopolitical situation and some of the weaponization of food and fertilizer that has happened. Ambassador Kimani, this is not a conversation for just one day. Africa on the global stage is an ongoing conversation. We've left a few things on the table for follow-up. But we just want to say today to thank you very much for coming down to be with us. It's been an honor. You have been very poignant, very um, strategic, very impressive, very inspiring in your comments. You've given us a lot to think about, even here at the Africa Center. And so we just want to say thank you very much. We hope we can have a follow-up conversation. To all of you, I would say thank you for coming out today to be with us at the U.S. Institute of Peace Africa Center. It's been a great conversation. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better interlocutor this morning to start our conversation on Africa and the global stage. So please, Ambassador, we say come back and see us. And let's give him a thank you. Thank you. Thank you.